Support for Amplified Voices comes from the Restorative Action Foundation. Learn more at restorativeactionalliance.org. Everyone has a voice, a story to tell. Some are marginalized and muted. What if there were a way to amplify those stories, to have conversations with real people in real communities, a way to help them step into the power of their lived experience? Welcome to Amplified Voices, a podcast lifting the experiences of people and families impacted by the criminal legal system. Together, we can create positive change for everyone. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Amplified Voices. I'm your host, Jason, here with my co-host, Amber. Hello, Amber. Good morning, Jason. And today we have Richard Kemick. Hi, Richard. Hi, Jason. Hi, Amber. So Richard, we're going to start with the same question we have asked all of our guests, and that is, could you tell us a little bit about your life prior to entering the criminal legal system and what happened that exposed you to it? Sure. I am a writer in a small town in the middle of nowhere in Canada. Whoa, Canada? Amber, we're international. (laughs) Wow, I'm pretty excited about this. This is our first international guest. (laughs) Well, it's an honor. So you grew up in Canada. I did. And for as long as I can remember in our family, we have had a cousin who's serving a natural life sentence in Michigan. And I never remember learning about this. Like it's always just something I've kind of known that my cousin Christian was convicted, but I I had never really talked to him at all. So I guess where I was before I started to become familiar with the criminal justice system is that I was a writer. And then I, I thought that maybe I could connect with my cousin and see what his life is like. How was Christian talked about in your family? Was it favorable or is it, this is just something that we know and it's a secret in our family and we don't really talk about it. You know, we didn't know a lot about him. What we talked about more than Christian as a person was Christian's sentence that the idea of a natural life sentence, so a life sentence without the possibility of parole, that doesn't exist in Canada. And just to kind of wrap our heads around, just from our perspective, how bizarre that was, almost impossible it was, that, of course, it changes between which country you're in. But in Canada, life sentence usually means a life sentence, but with the possibility of parole after about 10 or 25 years, depending on the charge, of course. So I do remember when we learned that a life sentence in Michigan was like a life sentence and just how, I guess, shocked we were about that. So what you're saying is culturally in Canada, it seems excessive or it's very surprising that there would not be any possibility for someone to be paroled after a certain amount of time. Very much so. Yeah. Now, mind you, it would have been about 20 years that I would have learned about the extent of Christian sentence. And in that ensuing 20 years in Canada, I feel a lot has changed to make a sentence like Christian's, a natural life sentence, more common. Now in Canada, for example, you can stack life sentences on top of each other so that the possibility of parole doesn't come around for like 75, 85 years. I think it is becoming a more common idea in Canada currently. Did Christian grow up in Canada also? Or is Christian from the United States? Christian is from the United States, born in Michigan, raised in Michigan, and now lives in Michigan. Okay. And the relation to you is how close or distant? He would be my second cousin. So my father and his father grew up together as cousins. But now my father moved out west when he was 17 or something back when he was wild and young. Uh, And then so (laughs) when I wanted to get in contact with Christian, I did so through my father. Like my father still knew how to get a hold of Christian's father. You mentioned that you're a writer. What got you more interested in this and wanting to reach out to Christian? How did that happen? That's a great question, Amber. I had gotten a hold of Christian's father and introduced myself to him and said, I'm a writer and I would just kind of like to talk to Christian about his life. Really, at that point, I wasn't sure that I wanted to write anything. This was about five years ago now. And so 
I just kind of wanted to reach out and see what he was up to, what he was doing. And then I got a hold of Christian and then started sending him JPEGs, those like emails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we started chatting on the phone and then I met him a few times in Michigan and we just got along really, really well. We had a lot in common and I found his perspective on both his incarceration, the length of it, and then for how long he's been removed from the outside world. I just found all of that really interesting, fascinating, really. So you've been corresponding with the JPEGs, probably 40 cents at a time, and now you're going to go meet him in person. Right. What's that feel like for you? What were your expectations and how was the actual encounter? Did it live up to what you thought it was going to be or was it very different? So Christian was incarcerated when he was 18 years old and he's now in his mid forties. And so when I was sending emails back and forth to him, I feel I got a tone of the person he was and we would kind of make jokes back and forth. I had been told by Christian's father that in person, Christian is just unbelievably shy, that he's kind of missed out on that part of life where we begin to see other people as people we can connect with and experience the world with and kind of broaden our own minds with. And because he's missed out on that and how unique his situation is, he's become very shy in the process. When I went to meet him the first time, that was kind of what I was going in with, was this idea that it was going to be hard to connect with him on just like a human to human level. And I feel we got along so well right off the get-go that it can only be because we are related. <laughs> I guess our fathers were both raised in this bizarre Austrian environment. So we had funny stories about how similar our upbringings were. And because of that, we're able to form this bond of friendship. Something that I also was taken by of how similar our upbringings were, it really drove home to me. At least this is where I was going into this, that I always thought prison only happens to other people that I would never be in that situation where I would be having to wrestle with what Christian's wrestling with because I would never succumb to that situation. But then hearing of how similar our upbringings were, how similar our lives are, and how similar our perspectives continue to be really shifted my perspective in that. So I'm really glad that you expressed that. And I wanted to ask the question, when you started interacting with Christian and when you went to visit, had you ever visited a prison or had you ever had any interaction with anybody who had been incarcerated before? I have a friend in Alberta who was in prison. He's recently on parole, but prison in Canada, I don't wish to make it too rosy of a picture, just because the Canadian and American prison systems are so different. I don't want to make it seem, however, that prisons in Canada are small, gated utopias. <laughs> he was in a medium security facility in Alberta. I met him when he was on like a work release, like he would spend all day out of prison working in town and then go back. And then so when him and I met, we were at a picnic table on a lawn eating chips. He was also in civilian clothes. It wasn't nearly as noticeable that we were in prison as to when I met Christian and like the different parameters of security that were in place at that time. When I got to the prison, I guess I don't really know what I was expecting because of Christian's charge, which is murder one. This is the lowest security prison he's eligible for. And so because of that, and because of my experience in medium security facility in Alberta, I guess I was taken aback by the level, I mean, it sounds dumb when I say it out loud, I was taken aback by the level of security that I wanted to bring a notebook and pen in. And so I knew that would be tricky. So I got an okay from the warden ahead of time. Even that was like a really large ordeal. There was one point when Christian and I met, since I was coming from out of town, they very kindly let me stay in the meeting room as long as visiting hours allowed. Usually you're only allowed a, a few hours. So we had spent really like the greater part of the afternoon together. 
at one point it was time for me to leave and I was coming back the next day. I needed a guard to escort me out and the guard who did so was on break and the other guards weren't able to leave their post to escort me out. And just in that moment, I thought like, wow, I, I really can't leave. It was a bizarre feeling and I was embarrassed to tell Christian this because of course that's what he's been experiencing the majority of his life. I guess it was the first time I had that feeling of being completely subject to the environment I was in. Just that bare glimpse, that quick glimpse of powerlessness that Christian, of course, and many, many people live with through large swaths of their life. Yeah, I mean, I can appreciate the thought on that, having visited a loved one while incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that I found most striking, some of the rules and restrictions just as a visitor have to go through in order to access your loved one. So if you're not wearing the correct type of shoes or, you know, I had a situation where I had misplaced my driver's license. And so I was like, well, that's fine. You know, I'm going to go tomorrow or whatever and get it replaced. And so I'm just going to use my government issued military ID. Okay, military ID. And they were like, I'm sorry, the regulation says a state ID. Mm -hmm. So they denied me access to visit my loved one because a U.S. military ID was not sufficient to prove that I was who I said I was. Right. You know, it's in the name of security, but it feels so much like a cruelty Mm -hmm. and it ripples out to the entire family. So that's what I wanted to share about that. Certainly. Tell us a little bit about the things you had in common. You mentioned some of your upbringing. What did you talk about in those couple of hours? We talked a lot about kind of his experiences in life that he has felt understandably, I believe, that ever since he got locked up at 18, his, I don't know, kind of life story in that sense has just been warehoused. Like it's just been put in a corner and that he's not really been able to share it with someone. I should say that Christian is also very fortunate compared to many prisoners in that he's in close contact with his parents, with some of his siblings. So it's not that he has no one to talk to, but he hasn't really met a lot of people to share his story with in that regard. When you said there was shyness and you didn't experience that. No, I had been pulled over for a speeding ticket minutes before in Michigan. When I drive a rental car, I drive it like I'm trying to win. (laughs) Anyways, but when I came into the visiting room, I had this story about the ticket and the real first use I've gotten from my English literature degree is the ability to talk my way out of a speeding ticket. So I feel like that was able to, I don't know, break the ice in a way that we were able to have a, a really nice time after that. So I didn't experience that, but I definitely see why he is so shy in other contexts. So you went, you visited him. I think you said you went a couple of times or a few times. Yeah. Did it change you? And when you told that story to your father, to other people in your family or friends, what's the reaction? That's a great question. Oftentimes I'm hesitant. I was hesitant to tell people about Christian not because of any type of shame or embarrassment, nothing like that. I think he's a wonderful guy. Him and I chat all the time. I talk to him more than I do most people in my life. I guess I became hesitant in telling people about him because it's kind of tricky to explain. I felt that when people would ask questions about his situation, the questions often didn't treat him as a human being or rather see him as a human being. And I feel like that is, of course, a direct result of the situation he's in. The situation that he's in discourages people from seeing him as a human being. Really, we only tolerate the situation he's in because we're able to stop seeing him as a human being. So when I would tell people about him, and in this time, he has become a very good friend of mine, that the questions they would ask 
like the one that I would invariably get the most, which just killed me on the inside, would be about like his sex life and that he was incarcerated when he was 18 and now he's in his mid 40s. And it just infuriated me that that for people would be like the most pressing question that they have rather than about what is the content of his character? How does he see the world or how he's doing or anything like that? So I found I wasn't, even though I would talk to him all the time, I wasn't really talking to other people about it so much because I would be so sensitive about it. You're having more intellectual conversations with him than the people who aren't incarcerated. How's he managing that? Totally. As opposed to like what you said, is he able to get an education? What does he care about? What matters to him? How is he keeping himself going? Yeah. So what's important to you from some of the things that you've learned about his character and what he's been able to do and what can you share? I am just blown away by how he's going to hate me for using this word sensitive. He is. So after talking to him for a few years, I thought that his voice was so unique just in the level of earnestness and compassion that he has in his voice and how, like, how enthusiastic he is about things and how deeply passionate he is about certain topics, that I wanted to include that literal voice in some sort of podcast to have people, I guess, in these conversations I would have with other people in which I would become very frustrated. I was unable to communicate his humanity, the fact that he is a human to the exact same extent that all of we are humans. And I felt like because I was unable to communicate that, that there was no better person than himself to communicate that, that when he talks about anything from falling in love to fantasy football, he does it in such an earnest and enthusiastic way that it's impossible to no longer see him as human. It's impossible to fall into those same traps of kind of thinking him and his situation as something so far removed as to be something else entirely from who we are. So when you are having those conversations with people and you're kind of thinking through, like, how do I show his humanity to the world? Obviously, being podcasters ourselves, we know that having conversations with people and the human voice and the way that we're able to connect with one another is very powerful. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. in that, when you hear someone speaking in their own words, it really causes you to be able to connect with that person in a way that is very unique. Mm -hmm. So am I hearing that there was a podcast or is a podcast that is developed? Yeah, there was just like a five episode podcast called Natural Life. We worked on it for years together. I don't know. I was talking to Christian about this the other day. It's almost like a sense of mourning in a way, just that it's all over is is kind of like a, it's a definite conclusion. I feel like there's very few definite conclusions in life where like something just, you know, ends. Right. But the podcast is called Natural Life and it's all complete now. It sounds like there was a sense of healing from doing that. Yeah. I don't want to speak for Christian. In my understanding, he has expressed his, I don't know, satisfaction maybe, or that he feels like he was able to tell his story without any ulterior motive or anything like that, just to be honest with himself of who he is and how he sees the world. It was really an opportunity for me especially now that it's a bit in hindsight, a remarkable and really rare opportunity for me. Because Christian and I spoke for years and years before I started to record him for the podcast, I feel we had developed like a deep sense of trust. And because of that, Christian afforded me, I feel a real candid nature, like that I was able to ask not just personal questions, but really like honest questions that I feel I was only able to ask. And he only felt, in my understanding, comfortable with answering because of this relationship that we had built over the course of years. So as a writer too, I feel like it was a really unique and special opportunity situation for me to be in. One of the conversations that sticks out in my head is that a feral cat 
snuck its way into the prison yard. And then Christian was talking about like, it must have been there since it was a kitten because now the cat is so large. He has this great line saying, Basically, if the cat I petted last night can still slip through the fence somewhere, I could slip through the fence. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. I feel like everything I've written in the past three years is now being bested by the story of the cat. <laughs> <laughs> so the cat must have snuck through as a kitten and then somehow survived. He says that part isn't super rare, but usually like the cat won't last the winter or usually they're so feral, they won't let anyone near them or touch them. So you almost never see them. But this cat, for whatever reason, was like a house cat. And one day during yard, he's lined up because he wants to run across the yard to call the woman he's been talking with. And he sees this cat and just his amazement that a cat lets him pick it up and pet it. And then he passed it off to another prisoner who then passed it off. And he said, like, it's the first time in 25 years I pet a cat. And just how amazed and grateful he is at this small snippet of normalcy in his life, which is just like scratching a cat and then passing it to someone else. I don't know. Just I think in a lot of ways, it's emblematic of who he is as a person, which is this insistence that he remains human, that he is still like a living, breathing person who finds joy in small areas of life, despite his circumstances. And those aspects of his personality is what I have come to appreciate so deeply in large part, or almost entirely is what made me want to work on this project with him. Logistically, how did you record it? All on my partner's phone. I have the oldest phone in the world. Uh, (laughs) So he would phone me and then my partner would show me where the record button is on her phone. But because phone calls are only limited to 15 minutes and he's only allowed at most two back to back. So they are about a half an hour long. Each episode would take us months because it's in such small increments and we do it once a week. And then slowly over time, we compiled material to support this project. Oh, that's fantastic. So you were working within some of the confines, obviously, of working with an individual who's incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So you hear those recorded voices on the phone call you are receiving. Right. So those of us who are familiar with it have gotten to love and hate all at the same time. You're happy to get the call, but you're tired of hearing that voice. Right. Talk a little bit about the cost. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a conversation around the country about the exorbitant cost of communications, whether they be emails, whether they be phone calls. Yes. And we're happy to say that here in Connecticut, just last session, through the efforts of many, many advocates, we were able to have phone call costs eliminated. It was a really huge victory. Whoa. There are efforts throughout the country to make that happen for other states. Of course, they're just shifting it to emails and tablets and things like that. But, you know, the fight will always continue. (laughs) Yeah. I was talking to my partner just the other day about this. I can't imagine how much money Christian's parents have spent on phone and JPEGs, not even on getting Christian things in prison, just communication with their son over the course of the 25 plus years he's been in prison with still, of course, a lifetime to go. Yeah, I was very, very fortunate in that I received it's called a Canada Council grant. So like the taxpayers of the country pitched in for this project and working with Christian. But in that, I have to fill out a final report at the end of it so that I was tallying the costs of these JPEGs back and forth. And then, of course, the phone calls as well. And it is unbelievable. It always seemed like a lot to me, but it wasn't until I had the spreadsheet on my computer and was submitting it to think that this is just an aspect of life, just part of their monthly bills that is folded into each month. Yeah, it is shocking. It truly is. When my loved one was incarcerated, we spent $700 a month on communication. You know, I'm sitting at my kitchen table trying to figure out how I'm going to pay the heat bill. So I'm glad that you have mentioned that. And I definitely want to call it out for listeners. Mm -hmm. Again, 
it's something that is unnecessary. It's something that continues to keep people in a cycle and it keeps people disconnected for those who are not fortunate enough. In our situation, we had friends and family that literally were like, here's money so that your kids can talk to your husband. Right. People are making those hard decisions between food and heat and all of that. So it's really important that the advocacy around that continues. Yeah. Richard, do you think that the world is safer because Christian is incarcerated for life? Jason, that's an excellent question. In writing this project, I tried as hard as I could to try and answer that question. Like at the root of it is me wrestling with this idea of should Christian be in prison? In that there's no question he committed his crime. I feel like a lot of true crime narratives are almost the opposite of true. Like they're true in the sense that sure they may have happened, but they're not the usual experience with the criminal justice system. That I think something far more common is Christian situation where he committed the crime, everyone knows he did, and that he is found guilty and then warehoused for this huge section of his life, in his case, his entire life. So in speaking with him and writing about him, that was kind of the question I was wrestling with. Should he be in prison, not so much on a legal level, but on like a moral level? I don't think any rational individual would say that the world is safer because he is in prison. Even the people I've talked with who believe he should be in prison, I don't think any of them would make that argument that he should be in prison because he's a danger to society. In my experience, the people who would make the argument that he should be in prison only do so out of a argument of punishment, that this is what needs to happen either to discourage other people from doing the act or to reprimand he himself for having done that. Normally, when you hear true crime things, it's are they innocent or are they guilty? It gets a lot of us frustrated when we're watching these movies where the guy is incarcerated, but it's really because he was actually innocent. And that's a horrible thing to have happen to anybody. But what gets missed in the larger conversation usually is how do you treat somebody who's actually committed harm? You've mentioned it and touched on it a little. Does that person lose his or her humanity after committing some sort of an offense? And how do we as a society deal with all of that? And we can either throw the person away, like the United States has been doing at a crazy level, or we could say, you know, that's really not working for us. We need to look at something that's a little bit different. How do you help people heal and re-enter society? Because what you talk about is just punishment for the sake of vengeance which Amber, I know you have a lot to say about this, doesn't heal the person who was harmed or the family of the person whose life was lost. If you're talking murder, or if you're talking about somebody being abused in some way, just pushing that harm off to somebody else doesn't bring healing. And if the deterrence doesn't work, we're just creating more harm for the sake of creating more harm. I am very, very cognizant of the conversations in the world and the heroic, falsely accused person that is constantly portrayed in media and true crime and the portrayal of extreme outlier situations in the media, which is just not, as you mentioned, the majority of people who find themselves incarcerated. So to Jason's point, how do we address harm when harm has actually been committed? And so you may not know, but I know that the people that regularly listen know that I was a victim of a sexual assault. And at the time that that happened to me, the harm that was caused to me was so significant that my whole thought process is lock this person up. For the rest of their lives, you know, if I could have sent somebody to harm them back, it would have been the thing that I wanted to do. But none of that would have brought me healing. You know, this is what I've learned. It's a healing journey for victims. And what I have seen again and again 
is that victims are also harmed by an adversarial system that basically leaves them in the dust, in their pain, in their hurt, with no services, with no help. And what do we have all the way around? Just a whole lot of harm. And when we talk about violence and when it happens, it happens in a context, right? So the idea that someone who has committed violence is thinking at that moment in that context and all of the converging factors that are happening, well, if I do this, I'm going to end up in jail for life, is just not how humanity and humans work. So that argument, while there is some validity, we have to have laws, we have to have all of that. I don't know that that is valid in my mind. And then what we see is that humans have this amazing ability to learn and grow and change. So when I think about who is going to help us break cycles of violence, who better than people who have experienced it and people who have caused it, but understand why and have been rehabilitated and can come back in the world and help us break these cycles. So that's what I think about it. It's from my heart. That's great. So I want to know just a little bit more about what are the things that Christian is passionate about? What is important to him? When you're saying he's talking passionately about topics that he cares about, do you think he would be okay with you sharing like what those things are? Yeah. The big one is when We had been talking for a few years, and then he met a woman through another inmate. And because he got locked up when he was 18, that in many ways, when he was falling in love with this woman and she with him, in many ways, it was like a teenage romance. But I don't mean that dismissively. I mean it like in the most beautiful way possible, just of like how deeply consumed he was in love. Kind of like when I think of my life, how he reminded me of when I was, I think like 18, 19, and had my first, what I would say, like adult relationship. And that he was just so thankful for the situation, like just grateful that luck had prevailed in the way that it did in his life to align the situation that he could meet someone. And that she felt similar as he did. Yeah, I would say by far was what he was the most enthusiastic about in the course of our conversations. Right. We've had a lot of conversations on this podcast with different people who have experienced incarceration and different things throughout their lives. But just think about like being 18 years old Mm -hmm. and you find yourself in a situation where your freedom is taken from you and you're in basically an institutionalized setting. So like who's teaching you like the best way to shave or, you know, all of the things that you experience between like 18 and 25 that are these years that you're really forming your identity. And that is all being formed in a very restrictive Mm -hmm. and oftentimes violent situation. It's hard to wrap your mind around how that forms someone. And then to think about, you know, how do I interact with other people and why is love so important to me? Why is love so important to me? Because maybe I've been so stripped of my humanity that finding love and being able to give love is such a gift. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be my response to why that might be something that he's so passionate about. Yeah, very much so. I think it was a really rare opportunity for Christian to have someone who chose to love him, I guess is the best way I can say it. Like, as I said, his parents are very present in his life. He would be aghast if I painted any other picture than how present his parents are in his life. So it's not that he is living absent of love, though I think in large part when he met Bridget was this singular instance in which someone who didn't have to love him did love him and very, very deeply. That is such a beautiful situation. And what a beautiful thing to be passionate about. Yeah. 
So kind of moving things forward and thinking about what are the aspirations? Because people have this idea that people who are residents of our prisons and jails don't have aspirations. Mm. Did Christian express to you or did you talk about his aspirations or at this point, there are people in the world that are working to change the idea that life without parole should exist forever. Is he aware of those efforts? Yeah, he certainly is. In my understanding, there is somewhat of a sea change happening in Michigan right now where natural life sentences could either be capped at X amount of years, whether that's 25, 30, or 50, or what have you, which would, of course, apply to Christian. Or there's also another change that's slowly developing, that because of Christian's age at the time he committed his crime, that too would preclude him from a natural life sentence. And that current prisoners who committed their crime when they were 18, 19, even 20, their situation would be dealt with differently than someone who at 35 or what have you committed a crime. Perhaps in addition to that, in relation to Christian's aspirations, I think maybe, Amber, too, it goes back to something you were saying earlier about this aspect of justice that actually addresses the wrong that was committed, rather than just kind of shoving it off to the side and behind bars. One of the first things we talked about is that out of everyone involved in his crime. So he commits a crime, which of course has a ripple effect throughout his family, of course, his victim's family. Out of everyone involved, he feels he got off the easiest because while everyone else afterwards is having to deal with the trauma and like the shattering of this life, that he is removed far from this and put somewhere where he doesn't have to see it, he doesn't have to deal with it. He gets updated on developments, but only in like the coldest and legalistic terms. So while everyone else, his mother, his victim's mother, are having to go through these incredibly painful points of transition in their lives, he's removed from all of it. And as such, I don't want to say like he hasn't thought about it. He's thought about it a lot, but he hasn't had to go through those same acts of transformation that everyone else who was touched by this crime, has had to go through. And so I think one of his points of aspiration, especially in the project that we were working on, is to kind of really attempt to see the scope of his crime and the reverberations of it, because he has been removed from those reverberations really now his entire life. So I think he was aspiring to have a truer understanding of what he did, which is kind of wild when you think about it, that the whole idea of prison in large part is this idea of like, go sit by yourself and think about what you've done. But because of the nature of it, it forbids that exact realization that we would want prisoners to have. The nature of prisons forbids that realization and that it removes him from the situation so entirely. It's almost impossible for him to grasp the severity of his action. Right. It lifts him up and puts him into like a whole new world with its own rule set. Exactly. And you just have to worry about what does it take to survive in a completely different environment? Yeah. So in my conversations with individuals, and again, I can't speak for myself because I've never been incarcerated, but One of the things that really touched me in speaking to individuals who found accountability in spite of the system. Right. So the system itself separates everyone. So it's almost anti-accountability because you don't have to face the person that you've harmed and say, how did this affect you? This is why I'm such Mm -hmm. a proponent of restorative justice and restorative practices, because it's centered on the harm that was caused and the person that was harmed and what they need. Mm -hmm. So actually separating and committing harm to both parties further, right? So it's not addressing the harm, but if you have to sit with someone 
and look at their face in a controlled environment that keeps everyone safe and know how deeply you've harmed them Mm -hmm. and also include other stakeholders like people from the community, the loved ones of the person that was harmed, the loved ones of the person who committed the harm. And then the people who also have a stake in it, like what in our society created the conditions Mm -hmm. where this became okay? So that will get to the root of the issue. So, you know, when I talk to people who found accountability in a system that is not designed for it, that is remarkable, right? Like so remarkable. Mm -hmm. And so as we're getting towards the end here, is there anything we haven't really covered that you want to make sure we do? I don't think so. It's been just wonderful talking to the two of you. I've really appreciated your time and your insight. It's been lovely. Do you want to talk about how to get to the podcast if they want to look for it? Totally. So the podcast's name is Natural Life. I think like one or two crazy like health food podcasts with the same name. But I feel like we've now overcome those in the ratings. <laughs> so in my understanding, wherever you listen to podcasts, if you just search up Natural Life, you should come across it quite quickly. Or you could go to naturallifepodcast.com. There's episodes there or links there that you can follow through as well. How about the writing that you do? Where do you end up publishing? Are you an author of books or are you in magazines or what's that all about? Both. I have a couple books, a wildly unsuccessful poetry collection. And then another (laughs) book I wrote a few years ago, if listeners perhaps are interested, my website is richardkamek.com. And we'll make sure that all of those links get in the podcast notes. That's very kind of you. Yeah. As we kind of wrap up the episode, I just really want to thank you for taking the time today. Like I mentioned previously, you know, we talked to a lot of different people in the podcast and It is very interesting to hear different perspectives. A lot of times when we hear from people, they're describing their own experience with incarceration or, you know, with a loved one like you're doing. When we talk about how things are surprising based on culture, I think it's really interesting to hear growing up in a different country with kind of a different criminal legal system is very eye-opening. And I also appreciate that you're like, I don't want to present that Canada has all the answers because we often hear a lot of people in reform referring to different countries and how they do it so much better and all of that. And while Mm -hmm. we are the leading nation in the world when it comes to incarceration, there are things that we definitely can learn from other countries. And unfortunately, what I'm seeing is a spread of the carceral logic Mm -hmm. outside of our borders rather than an influx of learning from others. I would absolutely agree with that. So I think we touched a little bit on that as well. And I would like to see it go the other way. Part of that is conversation we've had today and every little step and every little conversation and awareness is part of that. So I want to thank you for for the work that you're doing. My pleasure. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Richard Kemick. It was nice to meet you and talk with you and hear some of your story. And until next time, Amber. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to Amplified Voices, a podcast lifting the experiences of people and families impacted by the criminal legal system. For more information, episodes, and podcast notes, visit amplifiedvoices.show.